Hey guys, and welcome to creating a Postgres database in AWS. In this video, I'm gonna show you what the setup looks like for a Postgres database in AWS. And for what it's worth, it's not as simple anymore as just spinning up a database. You need to understand how VPCs work, how subnets work, and how database security groups work. Because in today's AWS environment, those are all necessary and you can no longer just create a uh, database by itself and use it. So we'll get into all those. We'll first look at the setup and then I'll walk you through how to set up your own AWS Postgres database so that we can continue with the Postgres masterclass and we can learn everything there is to know about this awesome SQL database system. All right, so the first thing we wanna look at is the setup in AWS. I mentioned earlier, in the past, you were able to just have a database in AWS, but now the new AWS rules are everything must exist in its own VPC. Um, so you can't just have a floating uh, resource that's not in a VPC. Now this is very simple. Once you get your VPC set up, and once you have your database security group set up, you don't have to keep redoing it. You can reuse the same VPC and you can have everything together, but it is just kind of necessary to understand what you're looking at if this is your very first time and getting going with these. So this is what the overall setup is gonna look like when we're done. Um, I promise you it's not nearly as complicated as it looks. So I'll just walk through right now what we're looking at here. So on the outside, you have the red dotted line and that is your VPC security group. So each VPC must belong to a VPC security group and you can define different security settings at the VPC level. Um, so we won't necessarily be messing with that much when we're just in this Postgres masterclass. Um, finally, uh, below that we have our VPC. So you can see that's the next uh, black dotted line and the VPC is going to have an internet gateway attached to it and that's going to allow you to um, connect out to the internet and uh, you know get different kinds of uh, IP addresses and, and route them through to the different resources that you need to uh, make them be able to access. Um, inside that we have this gray area and that's our DB subnet group. So a subnet is a sort of uh, VPC within a VPC. It's a, uh, it's a sectioned off area inside of a VPC, which is a virtual private cloud. And it's very handy for, for example, having separate security settings for different, um, air, for different groups of resources. Uh, a great example of this is just keeping your data separate from like a front end. So if you had maybe a Django server that was displaying a front end, you might want there to be some extra security on the databases that you don't need on the front end. And so that's the good thing about these uh, subnets. And then these can be found inside of a subnet group, a DB subnet group uh, to be exact. So we'll be specifying all of this as we set up the Postgres database. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily walk through setting up each of these by, them, by themselves, but as we go through the line items for the setup, it's going to be helpful for you to understand what these various things are. So we'll be setting it up in our Amazon RDS, which is their application database server, and they make it very, very easy for you to be able to spin something up really quick to specify a lot of great options. With Postgres, you can just you can actually specify, besides the size and the speed, you can also specify different extensions you wanna start out with so you don't have to add those later yourself. Um, and uh, one more thing to mention here is we're also gonna have an EC2 security group over top of our RDS instance. Um, for me personally, this is where I do a lot of, you know, allowing certain traffic in. Um, I, I never allow full access of the internet into my DB tables. I think that's obvious why, but I will act, you know, allow something like my local IP address, and I'm gonna show you how to do that so that you can keep yourself secure and safe as you go through this tutorial. All right, so I'm here now in aws.com, and I'll show you how to get to the section where we're gonna create our Postgres database. So the first thing you can see here in my recently visited services, there's RDS, which stands for Relational Database Services. But if you're on your own AWS account, it's probably not going to be that accessible. So you can go up here to services and then you can then just type RDS. Um, 
So we can get into different kinds of offerings in AWS in some later video series. Um, I have a lot of knowledge there and I uh, would love to share that with you at some point. So here we go to our RDS sort of dashboard. Um, you can see that the first thing they try and get you to do up top is they really want you to use Amazon Aurora, which is their own um, proprietary database. Um, it's MySQL and Postgres compatible. And obviously I think it's really cost optimized because they want you to kind of lock in with uh, their offering. Um, and I'm sure it's a really great offering, but for this tutorial, we'll just stick with the standard Postgres for now. So I'll just X that off. We don't really need it for now. So if you want to create a database, um, you can click this create database or you can go to DB instances. If this is brand new for you, you'll have zero out of 40. Um, and you can see them there. But for here, I'm just gonna go ahead and click the quick link here, create database. So you can see here, they're trying to make it even easier. There's this quick configuration option. Um, and there's also an easy create option. I'm gonna skip that for now because if you are a developer watching this channel and you really wanna understand fully what it means to set up your database and what all the different decisions are that go into it, then it's better to do it the long way and get a full understanding than taking the easy route, um, especially when you're learning. So I'm gonna keep it as a standard create method. Um, and then so then it goes down to engine options. And you can see here, AWS offers the gamuts, um, but I'm obviously gonna, collect, uh, gonna select our uh, favorite SQL database, that's Postgres right here. Um, Postgres comes out with new versions very fast. So if you are developing um, and you are creating perhaps like a new app, just keep in mind that your database uh, version will quickly become um, somewhat out of date. I know I started with a 9.6 a few years ago, Postgres. Um, you can see here they're already at 11.5 and they're gonna have 12 uh, very soon. However, there is some really good news. Uh, in RDS, you can actually keep your database instance, but upgrade to a newer Postgres version um, in RDS, which is a really nice feature. Uh, maybe we can get into that in uh, some future video series. But for now, we'll just go ahead and go with the recommended Postgres version um, in March 2020, that's 11.5 uh, R1. All right, so now we need to choose which kind of setup this is gonna be. Is this gonna be production? Is this gonna be dev or test? And is this gonna be free tier? Um, so what does that really affect when you're setting up the database? Well, what it really does is it kind of constrains, if you choose free tier, then they're only gonna let you do the really small kind of DB instance size. Whereas if you have production selected, then you can pretty much choose between all these different kinds of DB instance sizes uh, for whatever your needs are. So in the standard classes, you have these uh, pretty large uh, instances. The lowest one they let you do is an M3 medium, um, but then they also have these burstable classes, which includes the, uh, the free tier, the uh, T2 micro, but also the T2 medium, et cetera. So if you have a production setup, um, my recommendation would definitely be to start with the standard classes. If you have a very good use case where you need a lot of speed, then the memory optimized classes uh, might be for you. Um, but if we're just gonna start out, maybe we should just go ahead and use the free tier for this case. So I'm gonna go ahead and select free tier. Um, and you can see selected for me is gonna be the db2, uh, db.t2.micro which should be at no cost to you to kind of play around with. Um, so now we have our DB identifier. So you can see here, I've written in PG dash master class. Um, that's gonna be our master username. And for password, I'm gonna go ahead and put um, a password in there. You can see I already did it. Um, oh, doesn't like that. All right, so we'll go ahead and do PG underscore master class as the username, I uh, don't want to auto-generate a password. Um, and so you're definitely gonna to wanna to make sure you write those down. I don't think that the past password is gonna be easier for you to find afterwards. So make sure you write down your username, your password, uh, so you have it somewhere safe. And then for DB identifier, you're gonna to wanna to, want to name your database. Um, and this is really important because if you're gonna create a snapshot later and restore this from a snapshot, um, for example, you might wanna create a dev version that's kind of a identical snapshot to whatever you're working on right now. It's gonna have the same name. It's just gonna have a, or it's gonna have the same identifier. It's just gonna have like a, 
uh, a difference in the name later. Um, so we'll we'll get to that maybe in a future video. But the point is, uh, make sure that this is something that you're going to be able to remember and uh, have uh, close on hand as well. So you'll be signing in with the username and the password, but you'll be naming the database uh, the instance identifier. Um, so in this case, I'm going to write test underscore DB, and that'll be the name of our database. So once we get past the settings, uh, you can see that we kind of selected the instance size of T2 micro um, because of the fact that we want free tier. And now we go to storage. And with free tier, you kind of are limited. Um, so they give us the option of provision storage or general purpose. Um, we'll go with general purpose and we'll just keep all their defaults for the amount of storage and the maximum storage threshold. Um, so this would be basically the maximum storage would be if you have a database and it gets too big, it's going to auto scale to a certain spec uh, threshold um, once it reaches that point. All right, so now also we can look at the availability and the durability. So you can notice that it's not available to us right now to create a multi-AZ deployment, but we would want that um, if we had some sort of production setting where we were worried about users not having access um, in the case of some sort of backup, some sort of resource constraint, um, or some other need for redundancy that we could think of. What the multi, what the multi AZ stands for is multi availability zone. So they'll actually have your database in two different availability zones, and you can kind of fall over your traffic over to the next availability zone where your database is running if there's some sort of issue with your main uh, availability zone. So that's what's going on there. Um, again, if you're in production, probably something you want to consider. Um, and then finally, this is getting back to that diagram that I showed you at the beginning of this video. So this is where we select our whole setup for AWS. So virtual private cloud. So I've selected create new VPC. So if you were going to create a website, if you're going to create any kind of project, you'd want it all to be in the same VPC. There's very few use cases for having it in separate VPCs, but being the same application. So what you might want to have, for example, is a website with a front end in a certain subnet of a VPC and a database in a different subnet of a VPC. That keeps things nice and separate, nice and modular for security purposes, um, but also keeps them in an area where they can have a lot of the same uh, sort of security constraints and uh, IP addresses and things like that. So that's why we want to create the new VPC um, and we'll go ahead and, uh, and do that in the video. And then also the subnet group. So we have to create a new subnet group. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, every new DB in AWS needs a subnet group nowadays. So publicly accessible, we do want it to be publicly accessible. Um, in this case, we want to be able to query the database from our remotely from our, our computer. So we do want it to be publicly accessible. Now we will mess with the security settings so that not everyone can do it. We'll constrain the availability to just our IP address. Um, VPC security group. So I'm not gonna, well, I'll go ahead and choose existing. We'll just use a default security group for now. Um, we'll, we'll get into security at some of the other security group levels uh, later on. Uh, availability zone, no real preference here. You know, I'm already in US uh, dash East. Um, I, I happen to live in Northern Virginia, uh, DC metro area. So uh, for me, this just makes sense, but I don't have a preference here. Uh, port for Postgres, uh, 5432 is a standard port. Database authentication. I think we just want it to be password authentication. Um, if you're gonna use something like Psycho PG2 from Python to connect, um, then it's going to require whatever kind of database that you have um, set up here, whatever kind of authentication that you have set up here. So if you create something really crazy here, then you're going to have to, you know, have it kind of integrated with whatever you're going to use to uh, access the database. So additional configuration, um, things like initial database name, you have a, a DB parameter group, and um, enable automatic backups. I mean, this should definitely be checked. Um, this will, they'll basically take a snapshot um, during a certain time window and they'll keep them, keep that snapshot for you for something like the retention period, which would be by standard would be about seven days. So this is really helpful. If you get something corrupted, you accidentally drop all your tables. 
uh, you can go ahead and go back to your snapshot and restore from the snapshot in AWS. So definitely keep that. Even in the free tier, it's no extra cost. Um, and it's just a great feature. So you have some performance and some logging settings and uh, IAM roles. I mean, you can get real in the weeds with AWS. But for now, I think we're ready to go and we're ready to launch our database. Well, apparently we're not. So <laughs> I guess the name was not correct. They don't want any hyphens. They don't want anything else like that. So we're just going to get rid of the underscore and just call it test DB, no underscore. Oh, uh, this is interesting. So can't, can't keep any uh, names that are starting with PG because that's reserved by Postgres. So I'm just going to call this masterclass underscore PG. All right, now let's launch. All right, so our instance is now available. It's been created by RDS and it's ready for us to use. So how are we going to get remote access into this instance from our home computers? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to click on the actual DB identifier, test BD, DB, and then we're going to see all the different configuration details that are available to us. So in this case, you can see that we can see our CPU usage. Um, you can see the VPC security group um, and you can see the current VPC and the subnets um, that are available to us. Now, the VPC security group would be one way to constrain traffic and maybe allow yourself to have access. Uh, but I don't think you want to do that in this case. Um, in general, you're going to want to keep the VPC traffic open in case other parts of your application need open access. Uh, but what we can do instead is we can go down to the EC2 security group level and you can see that right here. So this is the security group that's actually attached to the RDS instance. And by the way, each RDS instance is running on an instance of EC2. They basically just handle all the server setup for you and kind of optimize it for you. Um, but in brass tacks, it is an EC2 instance. And so it has the same kind of security group setup that a regular EC2 compute instance would have. So outbound rules you can see is already allowing all IP addresses. That's what the zeros across the board means. But you can see that our inbound security group is only allowing uh, things from security group uh, E0, ED2D, uh, which is basically saying that it's only letting traffic in from inside our subnet, uh, inside our uh, VPC. So our whole VPC has access inbound to our RDS instance. But I've gone ahead and clicked on the security group so that we can actually edit the inbound to allow ourselves access to our own database. Um, and so if you're ever having maybe access issues, this is one place to look right away. And this goes for EC2 instances as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click on my security group and I'm gonna look at my inbound rules. So you can see that right now, the only inbound traffic allowed is from the current VPC. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and look for my IP and just gonna go ahead and copy that. And I'm gonna go edit inbound rules. I'm gonna add a rule. Uh, the port range is gonna be 5432. That's how we're gonna, um, that's how we're gonna basically log in. Oh, you can actually just select my IP. You don't even have to go find it on the internet. And I'm just gonna save from there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and save rules. And now, as long as I'm within my, you know, current um, uh, apartment, you know, right now I'm here. I have to be here because uh, we're being quarantined by the government. It's uh, three. It's, it's March 2020, so we're dealing with coronavirus and everything. But uh, the point to remember is that if you go to a Starbucks across the street and you're on their internet connection, your IP is going to be different. So you're going to have to add them to your security group inbound rules if you want to be able to work on your project from that Starbucks. Uh, but now what we have is a, a database that's accessible to us, to our IP address, but not to the general world. And so from here, we can go ahead and try to connect to the database. And I'll go ahead, um, I'm gonna do that next, but before I leave the AWS area, I just wanna show you how you can use this interface. Um, once you're in here, there's a lot of neat things you can do as far as backup, as far as rebooting, things like that. So one of the first things you can do is go to actions. And if you need to reboot the instance, um, if you're, this happens to me sometimes when I'm in Django and they have what's called a hanging migration. Um, we'll get into Django maybe in some future videos, but if I wanna reboot it, it's really easy. It's one click reboot. Uh, you can also take a snapshot. So if you just did a major change and you wanna make sure that what you did gets exactly saved, you can go ahead and take a snapshot. 
And then likewise, you can restore to a point of time. So if you just screwed everything up, you dropped your tables, you've corrupted a bunch of data, you can go ahead and hit this and it'll let you go back to any of those snapshots in the range where you had specified earlier. So for us, it's seven days, any snapshot in the last seven days and it'll let you restore using that snapshot. Um, and finally, you can also click modify, which uh, once I discovered it really made my life easier. What this does is takes a lot of pressure off of how you start using um, the database. So if you are worried that you don't quite have the right size, it's not a big deal at all. We've started with a free tier, but if we want to keep the same data and we want to upgrade it, you can do it right here. You can upgrade into the same instance type or a different instance type, and you can upgrade to larger sizes. So starting with this, we could upgrade to uh, any of the larger T, which is the burstable instances. We could go to the M4, which is sort of your standard, but uh, really big and production ready. And you can go to your memory optimized, like an R5 or something like that. So right away, you can modify, you can change everything without having to migrate all the data out of your previous database. And likewise, if you wanted to upgrade a version of Postgres, you could do that here as well. Now, something to remember is you can't downgrade, downgrade Postgres, but you can always upgrade. So if you want to start off with something like 10.6, where you're more comfortable, then you can always upgrade later, but you can't revert back to uh, 10.6 after you started with it. So those are some really cool things you can do in the AWS interface. Um, and now I'm gonna move on to show you how to connect to the database and we'll wrap up this video and be ready to go for the next videos. Okay, so for the final part of the video series, I'm gonna be connecting to the database that we just created in uh, RDS. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and first uh, use SQL Workbench. So if you're gonna follow along, um, you can just Google SQL Workbench. I have the URL right here. Um, you'll want to download SQL Workbench and then also the Postgres driver. Uh, both are completely free, so it's a good option for um, connecting to Postgres remotely. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to open up SQL Workbench, and you'll see that it's a new profile here. So this is asking for a new connection string to be able to connect to your database. Um, and so the first thing we're going to want to do is tell it what kind of driver we want. And in this case, obviously, it's going to be Postgres. And if you just got it, hopefully you just downloaded that. So now it's going to tell us the URL um, format that it requires. So we have basically these are kind of uh, filler, boilerplate. We have JDBC, Postgres. And then the parts that we need to fill in are going to be host, uh, port, and name of database. So for the host, what we're going to do is go back to our RDS um, console. And you can see here, I'm in the actual test DB page. Um, and I just got here from the uh, dashboard of databases, uh, if you're confused. So you click into the test DB page, and then you go down here to connectivity and security. And for the host string, we're actually gonna find this endpoint right here. It's the very first data point. And go ahead and copy that. So we'll just go ahead and copy that and paste it into exactly where host is. And now we've got our connection string ready to go. Uh, so lastly, for port, we, uh, we did 5432. I remember that because it's a standard Postgres port. Um, but if you're confused, you can also go and make sure and check right here. Now, here's where things get a little bit confusing, and that's the name of the database. You, know, you might remember when we were doing the initial setup, it asked if I wanted to create an initial DB name. Uh, I didn't. Um, honestly, I had a little bit of a of memory lapse there. Um, in most cases, you actually do, and that's going to be your quote-unquote name of database. And so when you do snapshots, that's what's, that's what's going to be your, uh, your name um, versus your identifier, which is TestDB. So your, your database identifier is at the front here. It's TestDB. Your name of database is something different. Um, so in this case, if you didn't select an initial DB name when you set up in Postgres, uh, it's going to choose one for you, and it's always just going to be Postgres. So that's going to be our name of the database. Um, so we can, uh, we can move on from there into our username and our password. So when I created this, uh, I created a, pa a username of masterclass underscore PG. And then there's a password. And... We can go ahead and test. So, awesome. So that means that we're able to get traffic. 
uh, we're able to get into this database from our IP and the connection was successful. So now I can just, well, first I'm gonna go ahead and just save this. I'm gonna call it my test DB connection. That way I remember, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hit okay. And here we go, I've got a bunch of my old queries that probably don't need to be here. Um, but now I've got basically an editor um, and I've got no tables yet, but we can create some tables in the next time. And here we're all set up to be able to use Postgres and continue on with our project. And if you are starting any kind of project, um, this is normally the first step. I know with things like Django, um, they're gonna have an, uh, ORM that's gonna do some of this for you, but if you're gonna create a bare bones project, usually you're gonna start somewhere with the database. Uh, so hopefully if you're following along, you've gotten uh, a lot of knowledge on how you can set up a Postgres database, and we're gonna continue on in the next video with how to create some data and load it up into RDS so that we can get going and we can use it from there. I uh, hope you stick around. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.